Hi, I'm Christian Triola, author of The Missing Method for Guitar Books. And in this new series called Guitar Profiles, we're going to take a look at some guitar players that you may or may not know to find out more about them. For this first video, I'm going to talk about a player that I think everybody should know. And yet, not that many people do outside of the jazz world. And of course, that guitar player is none other than Howard Roberts. Now, Howard Roberts was important to more than just jazz. In fact, he did a lot of things with the guitar in his lifetime that I feel should be mentioned. I mean, we have guys like Les Paul. Everybody knows his name, even if they don't know who he is. Andre Segovia. Fewer people would know who he is, but still enough might recognize the name. They were both hugely influential to the world of guitar. I would argue Howard Roberts, among others, should be on that list as well. And I'll tell you why later in the video. But first, let's take a look a little bit about Howard Roberts. He was born in Phoenix, Arizona, way back in 1929. So getting close to 100 years there. And when he was fairly young, you know, not right away, but you know, several years later, he started going to blues and jazz clubs that were in the area. And he was, like I said, fairly young still. So he started to learn how to play uh, the guitar and learned the language of the instrument and all this sort of thing when he was still pretty young from these professional musicians. So by the time he was 15 years old, he was already playing professionally, which is pretty crazy to me. I hadn't even picked up a guitar until I was 15. And while he was at these clubs, one of the people that really influenced him and kind of guided him as almost like a mentor was the trumpet player named Art Farmer. Now, fast forward a, a few years later, you know, he had moved out of his parents' house and he had this roommate and it was a piano player and they would practice three or four hours every single day, you know, first thing in the morning, go to a movie or hang out for a couple hours, then go play a gig. And so this was their life for a while. And it's kind of like the ideal life for so many musicians. Wake up, work on your instrument, take a break, go play, get paid, do it again the next day. And I, I know several musicians who would just love to have a life like that. And so how, this was Howard Roberts' life when he was young, you know, when he was uh, a teenager, basically. Then at 17, he got the opportunity to study with a famous composer, a man named Fabian Andre. Now, if you're not familiar with him, he um, taught a lot of famous composers, including George Gershwin, uh, Tommy Dorsey, and, of course, Benny Goodman. Now, Roberts couldn't actually afford to pay for the class. So he did have some money that he, he paid them. But in order to make up the rest, he actually got a job working for the school that uh, held this class. And so he would sweep up afterward, put up chairs, do whatever he could to earn enough money to kind of offset the price of the tuition of the class. And in doing so, he got to study with one of the greats. And of course, during all this time while he was playing, meeting all these people, some of the people that were influential in his life, one was the saxophone player, Dexter Gordon. He met and kind of got to know Henry Mancini, the composer, uh, the guitar player, George Van Epps. And so all these people were kind of in his life at a fairly young age. You know, he was part of this musical world. Then, of course, at the age of 21, he moved to Los Angeles, where I'm sure he met some of these people there as well. And the, the story goes that he showed up with his guitar, his amp, and little else. He didn't even have a place to go. So it's kind of up to him to find a gig, get some money, get a place, and get started in L.A. And it wasn't long before he started making some important contacts. One of those people was guitar great Barney Kessel. Uh, and then another one was a man named Jack Marshall. Now, Barney Kessel, of course, is one of my favorite guitar players, so I could just imagine the things he must have learned from Barney Kessel. But it was through Jack Marshall that he got his big break. Jack introduced him someone at uh, the Verve record label, and so he put out a couple albums with them. I'm not sure how many off the top of my head. And then later, he was signed to Capitol Records, where he put out, from what I understand, most of his album from that point on. But if it wasn't for his contact with Jack Marshall in those early days, you know, it may have taken a different path. I'm sure he would have still been a professional. I mean, the guy's a fantastic player. Now, even though he's known for his jazz recordings among guitar players, he's also known for two main other reasons. One of those reasons may even surprise you. Howard Roberts 
was a big part of television in the 1960s. So if you're a fan of classic television, chances are you have heard Howard Roberts play if you haven't heard any of his jazz records. And so like many guitar players, he played other styles of music. He just wasn't a jazz player. He also played bass. He also played mandolin. So he contributed the guitar. He recorded the guitar for TV shows such as The Twilight Zone, that opening theme that you hear, that's Howard Roberts playing the guitar. He also played on shows like M.A.S.H., The Beverly Hillbillies, I Love Lucy, The Munsters, Gilligan's Island. He also played the theme from Batman in the 1960s, The Andy Griffith Show, and of course Peter Gunn, which is kind of a guitar cliche at this point. And so he had contributed a lot of his music, a lot of his recordings to television. And when they needed someone um, to play guitar for a TV show and for movies, he was the guy that you called, Howard Roberts. He was also known for his work with a famous TV band, The Monkees. He's often cited as the fifth monkey because he recorded so much music with them. He, of course, was never on the show that I'm aware of, but uh, he was a big part of that group, and that part of that group's success was because of Howard Roberts. So overall, in his career, he recorded, as a sideman, over 5,000 tracks. Can you imagine that, being in the studio that often? 5,000 songs, you call up Howard Roberts, he'd get the job done, basically. As a leader, as a band leader, he put 20 albums of his own out. So that's just a huge body of work, counting the television, counting, counting his work as a sideman, counting his work as a solo artist. Now, a couple tracks that I'd like to you know, draw your attention to that I think are outstanding. Of course, you can watch any of those TV shows that he played on, but also uh, the song Misty. He does a great rendition of that tune. Uh, it's a jazz standard. It's from the 1966 Capitol Records recording all-time greatest instrumental hits. So not the greatest title for an album, but otherwise a great album. And his version of Misty on there is outstanding. Another one that you should check out is his version of Satin Doll, which he did on a 1963 Capitol Records album. Color him funky slash HR, meaning Howard Roberts, is a dirty guitar player. Satin Doll on that recording is an outstanding track. I highly recommend checking that out as well. Not only did Howard Roberts have a huge impact on television and the jazz world, he also had a huge impact on academia. And this is kind of why he's a little bit one of my heroes, let's face it. Because he developed a guitar curriculum that was used at a place called the Guitar Institute of Technology, which opened up in 1977. And it was the first nationally accredited guitar school, essentially. And it was more or less founded by Howard Roberts, which I think is fantastic. It still exists to this day under its new name, the Musicians Institute. And so he produced all this material, all this curriculum. He wrote articles, all sorts of things, and trying to make guitar music more accessible to more people. And I think he succeeded. A lot of the terminology we use today and the way we talk about the guitar comes from Howard Robert. Now, since this is a guitar channel, I want to do more than just talk about the man himself. I want to talk about the gear that he used. So, of course, he played many different guitars, many different amps, things like that. But there are a couple that really stand out. His main guitar was a Gibson ES-150. And he actually got that guitar from Herb Ellis, another great guitar player at the time. And interestingly enough, it was considered the Charlie Christian model. So there's all these guitar players associated with this type of guitar. And it's kind of a hollow body like this. I'll put a picture up here in a second. Then, of course, for the studio, he often used a, a Gibson L4, but it was heavily modified. So he kind of did a lot of tinkering with it, made it his own. Gibson at one point approached him and built his signature model guitar for him. So it was done exactly to his specifications and he played it. He said it was the greatest guitar he's ever played on. And of course, three months later, the guitar was stolen. So eventually, of course, he got different guitars and moved on with his life, let's say. But uh, what it's, it just kills me knowing that that's the case. The greatest guitar you ever got and it's stolen three months later. I, uh, the story bugs me, man. All right, anyway, as time went on, of course, uh, Gibson and Epiphone both worked with him to do other signature series models. 
The most recent, if you can call it recent, was still quite a while ago. The Howard Roberts Fusion 3 came out in 1991. Uh, all these different models that came out are very sought after. A lot of people just love the sound, the nice clean tones that they get. All right, so that's enough with his guitars. Let's move on to amps. He had a really cool looking amp. It was a Gibson, not a Fender, Gibson GA50. It looked like a piece of luggage with a speaker on the front, and yet it had a beautiful clean tone. He also played on a Benson 300HR that had a 15-inch JBL speaker in the cabinet. And so he used that quite a bit with recording, especially later in his career. Sadly, Howard Roberts died at the age of 62 in 1992. So it was a year after his last signature model guitar had come out. It was really a bummer. You know, he died of cancer. And it would have been great to see and hear what he would have done had he lived longer than that. But he still made a huge impact on the guitar world. So I hope you can see that, you know, he had this huge influence on guitar players, on guitars themselves with a signature model, television, movies, and education. So Howard Roberts had his hand in all this stuff and helped shape the guitar as it is today. Now, if you want to learn more about Howard Roberts, be sure you check out the howardrobertsproject.com. It's a website devoted to all things Howard Roberts, as you could expect. I checked out the site recently. It's got great information and goes into more detail than I can do here. Also, be sure to check out themissingmethod.com. And while you're at it, go ahead and give this video a like. If you enjoyed it, let me know in the comments. If you've got some information about Howard Roberts that you feel really should have been here, let me know as well. And if there's somebody you'd love to see me profile in a future video, let me know. All right, we'll go ahead and get to practicing. Look up some Howard Roberts, look up The Missing Method, and I will see you in the next video.